Well, I'm delighted to say that uh, joining me on the Godcast today is uh, Jonathan Higgs. And Jonathan is the frontman and lead singer of uh, the band uh, Everything, Everything. Jonathan, it's, it's great to get you on the Godcast. How are you? I am good. How are you? I'm all right. Yeah, we've got lousy weather here in in uh, mid-October in Burnley. Where, whereabouts are you today? I'm in uh, Stockport, so oh, not, just as bad. <laughs> not far away, yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. So, so you, but you're you're um, you're from the northeast, is that right? Is that right, Jonathan? I was born in Newcastle. Yep. Yeah. Um, I've lived in Manchester now for just slightly longer than half my life. So I guess I'm now a mank. But call me what you will. I don't sound <laughs> like it. I'm from Newcastle. I'm just from the north. It's funny that, isn't it? Because we kind of refer to ourselves as northerners. Do you think there's um? There's much of a difference between Newcastle and Manchester. Uh, yes, but not that. I mean, the UK is so ridiculously varied from like village to village. Um, you, if you were foreign and you came to both, you'd think they were exactly the same, shall we say? But obviously, we think there's loads and loads of differences, imperceptible differences. The weather's much worse up there despite the reputation that uh, Manchester has. Yeah. So do you, do you consider yourself Geordie or are you, you know, an adopted mank? What do you kind of think about in those terms? Or I do honestly don't know. I, I, I kind of don't know. I don't think it's up to me because um, it's really how other people view me. Um, I think of myself as just being a northerner, I guess you would say. Mm. Um, but I mean, my... My heart does beat when I see something to do with Newcastle, but um, I don't know. I, I look out for Manchester as well now. Um, you know, when it's on the international stage, for example, I'm like, oh yeah, Manchester. Yeah, and and as a kid growing up, what was what was the music scene like up up there? Was it was it quite vibrant? Were there were there bands that you were noticing or? Or were you looking further afield for your musical influences? The scene in Newcastle wasn't really great at all. Um, and it still struggles. I mean, they don't have the infrastructure that somewhere like Manchester does. Uh, Manchester's just kind of set up for it so well. Um, the history it's got, obviously, of bands, the, the venues, the whole setup really is is ready for bands. Basically, Newcastle doesn't have it. Unfortunately, There's, there are some great bands that come from there and Sunderland, um, but no, it doesn't have the same uh, vibe at all. Unfortunately, we often thought that it would <clears throat> that would happen, but it just I don't know. Maybe it's happened and I haven't noticed since. Mm. Yeah, and uh, you know, I've, I've been listening to your band quite a lot over the last few days. Uh, and you're very unique, I would say. But but who were your influences as a kid then? Who who are you listening to? Um, like everyone, it was the Beatles. I think they're a really good band for children. Actually, um, that's often overlooked. I think they're really creative. Oh, <clears throat> of course, they're creative. They're really sort of colourful. I think for for children, they're uh, so varied, song to song, and very approachable. But there's complexity. Um, we all know about the Beatles, obviously. So, more in, more more interesting ones, I guess. My parents listened to Simon and Garfunkel a lot. Um, the vocal harmonies that they do is something that's definitely had a big influence on me. Um, and they were really into this band, the Bonzo Dog Doodah Band, who were kind of surreal seventies or sixties, uh, kind of like Monty Python almost, but right. music. Um, and they never really crossed over into the mainstream, but they're like a huge cult band. Um, and they're, and they're, there's a lot of humour in that. Um, and a lot of just weird stuff happens, but in quite an approachable sort of format. So I think that had a bigger, bigger influence on, on me than I realised. Um, and then later it was, you know, Nirvana, like everybody. But not, not that crazy, basically. Uh, Radiohead, if you sing high, I probably listen to you. Um, and then latterly, I really liked the sort of American R&B world of things like Destiny's Child, uh, R. Kelly, although 
not allowed to listen to him anymore. <laughs> I know, it's a huge disappointment, isn't it? I used to like R. Kelly and, uh, you know, you think, oh, crikey, we can't go there anymore, which is a, which uh, is a shame. But uh, and, and what about um, your, your voice? Um, when did you... When did you realise that you that you had a talent to sing? You know, were you was this through school days, or, or was it at college, or when, you know, when were you aware of the potential of your voice? Um, not for a long, long time. I, I sang in the choir at school, but I was a bass, you know, um, and I was in bands all through school. From about thirteen onwards, I had a band, but I was an absolutely terrible singer. Um, some might may, may say I still am, but even <laughs> right through uni, I was just shit basically. Mm. But I would was really ambitious in what I was trying to sing, which is was part of the problem. Um, trying to sing really high, really fast, and stuff like this. And I guess I slowly because I I did this thing where it, when I came to a high note, I would just sing it falsetto so I could get the note and move on. Look at me with my trump hands, and uh, but then I didn't really care about keeping it consistent. So I would sing a, a melody in my regular voice and then there'd be a high note. I'd just go to falsetto. I know it's not that weird, but I would do it so much that I got really good at doing that little switch. And then I found that people really liked that about the way I was singing. Um, and it sort of became the way I naturally sing everything is to, is to do this sort of in and out technique. Um, and then obviously my voice did get better and better as time went on to the point where I didn't really have to do the technique anymore. But I enjoy it and I think people like it. So it kind of, I sort of fell into it by accident. I never had any proper training. Um, it was just sort of absolute trial and error, years and years of just kind of going, I don't care if I'm shit, I'm going to sing this. Yeah. The kind of Billy organ approach, I think. Yeah. And what about writing? Were you writing as well from a young age? When did you kind of... Uh, get the bug for that was that was that an early thing as well yeah that was like 13 14 pretty much as soon as I heard Nirvana and I realized that you could play you know two or three notes um it didn't matter it didn't have to be the Beatles um although they obviously have that side to them as well um so yeah as soon as I could play one string on a guitar I was writing songs um and they just obviously it just went from there but that again that's just 20 odd years of that now um it mounts up yeah and as a young as a young guy i'm thinking when i was a kid which is years ago you know there's all that angst and testosterone running through your veins isn't there what were you writing about john was it kind of was it were you quite a philosophical young man were you, were you religious in any yeah. way what were you thinking about i was very um I definitely wanted the lyrics always from day one to be um, quite serious and deep. I remember I, I had this song, I played it to my mum, the recording of it, I didn't perform it. And, um, and it had this line about uh, sound the horn and let's bring down the hunt or something like that. And, um, and she was like, what's that mean, Jonathan? And I was like, oh, that's, that's because I hate hunters or something like that. And she was like, oh, very deep, very deep. And I remember her saying that and, and thinking, oh, right, is, the, is she taking the piss out of me? I don't, I, I don't really know. Um, but yeah, but that was when I was like 14 or whatever. So it was definitely always trying to be thoughtful, certainly. I never, I didn't really have a stupid period. Although I did have, we did have one song in my first band called George. And it was just like me talking over the top of this really stupid song about this, this guy called George and what okay. happens to him. Yeah, and what no, about Sorry, what about on. religion, John? We we was religion part of your life growing up, or uh, did you give it no. much thought? Have you ever has it ever been on your it's agenda? Been, yeah, I certainly gave it thought. My mum's sort of reasonably religious, comes and goes. I think my dad isn't at all. Um, I never, I don't think I ever had a period where, where I was. I can remember having a sort of epiphany excuse the term uh when I was about maybe 15 16 um about the whole thing really and just kind of going there's there isn't anything there um and feeling very proud of myself um for figuring it out in that, in that teenage way um and I wouldn't say I've I've come back on that but I'm 
I think a, a young person can often be quite, uh, I think, quite mean to believers if they aren't one themselves. And I think I've come back on that a hell of a way. Um, there was a time where I, would be, I was a pretty horrible atheist. Mm. Um, and I'm not like that now, but I, I wouldn't say my faith has ever, you know, flared up. Ever, no, really. <laughs> it's, it's quite interesting because I've spoken to quite a few atheists on the Godcast, and most of them like to kind of uh, reiterate the point that I'm, you know, look, I'm not a full-on kind of, you know, uh, you know, I think you're all absolute arseholes, you know. There, there seems yeah. to be a, a sympathy there, and and um, and still an inquisitive nature, even though they they proclaim to be to be atheists, which is quite interesting. And and yeah, go on, Jonathan. Are you going to say, say something? No, I have instantly. Okay. I was, I was um, when I when I was looking you up, you kind of described as an art band, and um, I'm I was wondering about that. I was like, I'm not. I love my music. I was thinking about art bands. I suppose I'm probably a bit older than you, but but the one that's that kind of craft work come to my mind for me as as an art band and, and maybe Sparks and and. Um, I'm, I'm a huge Depeche Mode fan, Jonathan, and their their visuals are incredible. With a guy called Anton Corbin, who who, who, who kind of turns the music into something else. How important is that side of the the um, uh, the band? Is is that for you as as the artists? Uh, visual side. Mm. Oh yeah, hugely. We were um, well. Right now, we're actually talking a lot about presenting ourselves in a certain way um and we are pretty we go pretty hard when it comes to that we um we talk about it and we try stuff out hugely because it's yeah i mean all the bands all the great bands that i consider great have a good a good idea about visuals basically um from you know queen to radiohead obviously the beatles um and it's ones that don't care about it, say Oasis, that you puts them in a different type of category, I would say. Not that they're not a great band, but you don't, I don't consider them in the same way. Um, so yeah, we, we, we do absolutely go, go really hard. I've always made, not entirely, but I've made about 90% of our videos ever. I've directed them or sometimes just made them from nothing. Mm. And that's been a pretty good, um given us a really good connection of to it ourselves because we're the creators so the next thing we're looking at is doing artwork ourselves now producing ourselves now so that's kind of like the final step and and where do you get the inspiration for that is it is it something you uh contemplate over a long period of time or, or do you just kind of think wow this is what i need to do i've watched some of your videos are, are really um visually interesting um um you know and, and i think well they, they make me think you know and i like music that makes me think that rather than just kind of give me all the answers i like ambiguity behind songs and is that is that intentional with what you do oh definitely um gotta keep a, a good few layers of mystery um just gotta get the right amount that's the thing that the longest the longest running conversation that we that we have as a group of friends in the band is sort of where we draw the line between comprehensibility and art or mystery um and walking that balance and sometimes we tip too far into making things too obvious sometimes we tip the other way um so that's all that's completely ongoing and i'm obviously i think that's probably the same for all bands really um all artists really but yeah, it's it never ends. <laughs> Just when you think you know your audience, they surprise you, or they might not get something, or they 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 hone in on something you never intended. Mm. You know that kind of thing that you can't predict is interesting. And does that apply to your bandmates as well? Do they sometimes go, "Oh my goodness, uh, where is Jonathan taking us with this?" You know, or or do you kind of give them a clear? You know, I, I like you, I know what you said there about the layers behind the music, but um, you know, uh, do, 
as a band, are you all on the same page, I suppose, in terms of where it's going? No, we're not at all. <laughs> um, because a hell of a lot of the time, I mean, I write the lyrics. I don't necessarily write the music. Alex writes a lot of music now. Mm. Um, and sometimes I he'll present me with a song and say, John, can you sing something on top of this? And then I'll sing something and then three weeks later, you know, give him the demo back and then he'll go, actually, John, I was, I was thinking about um, a mining disaster in, in Wales when I wrote this. And I'll be like, I've just written loads of lyrics about, you know, my sister's baby. <laughs> and then he's like, yeah, but do you think you could maybe, you know, make it a bit more about the Welsh mining? And just, you know, it's a, that's not quite the example, but it's like that. Mm. Or I'll write a load of lyrics and then, and I'll think they're fucking great. And then Mike will come up to me a few days later and say, John, what the hell does this mean? Or mm. I really like that song you've written about and you just come mm. out with something completely different. And, uh, and uh, sometimes I will explain myself and sometimes I just don't want to or uh, I can't, or sometimes it doesn't mean anything, something I've written, a line here or there, or it's like a joke and I don't want to tell them mm. that it's just a joke, you know? And all these things combine and recombine when you've got four people with four sets of ideas and 12 years of history in the band and, and all the things we've done before, and it gets ever more complex, the, the type of uh, decisions we have to make. Yeah. And, and do you enjoy that, that creative process? Is it, is it part of the, uh, you know, I mean, I suppose as fans, you know, I, I, I just want, I just want the Pesh Mode to rock up every year really. And with, with something new, but I understand yeah. there's a process to that. Do, do you, do you enjoy that kind of beginning of a project? And, and does that normally start with you saying, right, I'm, I'm going to go right in. And how long would you commit to that period as well? Well, I enjoy aspects of it. I tend to, I like the blank slate, but sometimes it's very daunting, especially when you feel like you've just, like your last record was like the best thing you're ever going to do, especially when it's like that. Um, so I'd say that the, the greatest joy in my job is that is that moment where you've just just written something new before you show it to anyone and it's just yours yours and the universes mm. um that's a, an exquisite joy you can't really doesn't feel like anything else to create and and then and know it's good or at least you think it's good um so i i love the like the moment of creation but i despise everything that comes after so showing it to anyone hearing what they think about it changing it mm. um refining it explaining it recording it mm. like you we there's a thing that you'll get with bands called demoitis where it's a disease of the mind where you fall in love with a demo and then you go to the studio to do it for real and you're like it's not as good as a demo it's not as good as a demo and you haven't sung it like you've sung it on a demo or and that strikes a lot especially the longer the gap is between writing it and recording it yeah you'll you'll, you'll get demoitis bad um and there's four of us all getting demoitis for different things, you know, so it gets, it gets crazy. And I don't I dislike all that, but um, when it's all done and it's like release day and it's like, look at how much, look at how fucking great this is. Like we worked so hard on that and that and that, and look how good the lyrics are and listen to how fucking good I am at singing this and <laughs> listen to Mike on this track and then look at this fucking video. And it's all there and it's all done that feels amazing mm. and so does going out on tour mm. so having the, like the moment of creation is great the moment where it's all done is great but everything else, else in between is kind of torturous when you've um, written when you've written a track and you kind of think oh this is just brilliant How, do you share it quite quickly or or do you or do you discipline yourself enough to say i need to put that in the drawer for a week or two before i reveal it to anybody else no, oh. a day or two at most i would say um, I usually can't can't wait, um, but sometimes I'll send them to like someone who isn't in the band, maybe, um, so I don't have to get. 
because we've been doing it so long in the band, it, it's unusual that someone will respond with like, oh my God, this is the best thing. They'll be like, yeah, it's great. Um, maybe we could try this, you know, <laughs> because we, it's, it's work. Mm. Mm. Uh, and so if I just want, just for once, you know, once in a while, I just want someone to just like, oh my God, that is amazing. Then I send it to someone outside the band, for example, get yeah. that initial reaction, like a fan reaction. And yeah. then I get a, like a, a colleague reaction after that. And, and those gaps in between albums and, and new material, do, do you enjoy that time? You know, I mean, I mean, I can't help think, well, I'm thinking, what are these guys doing? I need more music. I need more music. Um, but do you enjoy that downtime? Do you, do you, do you use it wisely or, or just chill out? What, what, what do you kind of do with it? No, I don't use, use it wisely at all. Um, it tends to be one way or another we're, we're already working on the next thing. I mean downtime at the moment it doesn't really exist because you're either promoting singles which effectively for me means making videos or you're on tour or you're back in the cycle and you're writing again so it may appear like downtime but really it's probably writing that we're doing or touring that we're doing but touring's been completely messed up by uh, the pandemic so we had to do the other one which is right yeah and i want i just want to ask about um producers you do um and and obviously you're you're obviously kind of um <laughs> sounds a bit ridiculous to say you're hands on you're in the band of course you're hands on but but some people are happy to hand their music over to production and producers who kind of mold it and gel it where where are you as a band with that do you, do you like to keep that overall control or are you, or you or do you like a producer coming in and saying have you thought about this or that I kind of like the idea of it more than I like the reality of it. Um, I haven't honestly enjoyed working with producers mo most of the times we've had them. Not that it's a, it's a miserable time or they're not being nice people. It's just, I've got my own thoughts about how things should be. And Alex has got his and he's way more into production than I am. I think, and obviously the other guys do as well. And it's like, we're a bit sort of overqualified, I think, in lots of yeah. ways in, in this group. And that's sometimes is cause for um, things not going smoothly because we all unfortunately or fortunately do know quite a lot about music and production and things like this. And we all think we know best and there's four of us, you know, so it can get um, sticky, you know, cause it, the best thing a producer can do is is just be decisive. When we're left to our own devices, that's when things really get bogged down because we all are producers in our heads. Mm. However, we we are now at the stage where we're going producer free and we are doing it ourselves. So that's pretty exciting. Alex is producing the record um, that we're thinking about making, shall we say? And you you've been together a long time, haven't you? And you've and you've had that consistency. That, um, you know, some bands kind of break up and have a fallout and a tiff and come back together, but you've been pretty consistent. Is is that down to um, kind of just a friendship or just kind of um, uh, that, that musical connection? It's a few things. I think we had our fallout before the band started. We did have another member before the band, before anyone knew who were, shall we say, before us were. Um, and that was kind of the drama. And then after that, it's been smooth sailing. So I think we were lucky to kind of get that done because um, that was the kind of thing that would have destroyed a band later on. Um, so that that was, I guess, lucky in a way. Um, but yeah, I think we're, I think we're pretty well suited to our roles. One of the main problems that occurs in in bands that split up is people um sort of encroaching on each other or trying to be in charge of everything you know the usual stuff that destroys any community um ego really um and i think i yeah i i have an ego but i also know that i'm not very good at quite a lot of stuff um and i think that goes for all of us and we and we're pretty good at the things that we're good at 
and luckily there isn't a huge amount of overlap so Alex and I will write music Mike and Jeremy just don't write music and they're totally cool with that I think you'll get that doesn't always happen you know you'll get the, the drummer wants his song on the next record and those kind of tensions just haven't arrived for us and we're quite self-sufficient so I can produce videos which is lucky you know um we all have a good just a good head on our shoulders when it comes to our roles I think and we're not uh too precious about it yeah <clears throat> and and as you reflect on the career with the band today are, are you content with your lot today I mean obviously you're still a, a relatively young guy and there's there's much to come but are, are you pleased how, how it's panned out for you as a band no we should be way bigger obviously um can I, Jonathan can I ask you can I ask you about that though because yeah I get that you know and I've and, and I had a really good chat with Rick Witter from Shed 7 about you know kind of popularity and things like that and and but um you wouldn't you wouldn't compromise your your musical integrity to be to be more popular would you um would you? I, I <laughs> would yeah and I think I do I think if I if if Jonathan from our first record heard our last one he'd be like what the hell is this crap and if I had a conversation with him it would probably be an argument um but there comes a line where you, where I don't even think it's good it's a tricky thing because I'll listen to very pop pop a lot of the time actually probably most of the time and I sit down and write a song and I think I want this to be, this could be sung by, I don't know, Ariana Grande and it would be number one. This is what I'm trying to write right now. Mm. And I'm going to produce it in that way. I'm not even going to try and subtly change it. I'm just going to do the thing. And uh, it still comes out really weird. <laughs> and as soon as I sing on it, obviously it's it's not going to number one, but it's, um, no, I mean, the question of would I, would I debase myself and write like pure pop? It's like, yeah, I have been for, I've been trying to do that since like our second record. Um, please, can I be more like that? <laughs> um, <laughs> but it just never, it just doesn't, doesn't happen because we, people view us in a certain way. And you could, you could probably transplant one of our songs and put it on someone else's record and no one would notice that it was us, if you know what I mean. They would just think, oh yeah, that's Sam Smith being a pop a pop star. Um, it's interesting. I think it's about perception and we built up a certain uh, reputation that, you know, we're a kind of Mercury style band and we're a bit sort of nerdy and stuff. But if you actually analyze the music, it's no, no more complex um, than very, what's considered like very pop pop it's weird it's one of those yeah. things and sometimes really pop is is actually complex as, as anything mm. it's kind of how you how it's being perceived by how it's presented more than anything mm. but you are popular you i mean you you might not be selling out wembley stadium but you you have it it seems you've got a, a very good uh, fan base that that love what you do and will come and see you you know, kind of bands, oh, yeah. a bit similar to bands like Shed, Shed Seven. You know, and um, you know, and um, I was wondering, is that is, does that evolve as well? You know, do you attract? Um, I, I went to uh, Tramlines this year and watched. Purposely wanted to go and watch bands I'd not seen before, and I was just blown away by the the quality of the music. Are you? Are, do you find that young guys are still uh, interested? Come and see you. Do you find new fans coming to to everything? Everything? Yeah. I am always surprised to see young, like 18 year olds, whatever, um, at our gigs. In fact, we, we've, all, we've always had, strangely, we've had like a following of like little kids, particularly on our third record that seemed to resonate with like under tens in a big way. I don't really know why, um, but I'm certainly not complaining. I think if a band gets into you at that age, it, it really does change your life, um, which is awesome. And maybe some of those kids are, uh, old enough to come to shows now but i also think yeah we still we do still attract young uns once we see the age of the crowd start to to go up that's probably when we're 
we've made us the wrong step i think yeah and just to talk about the business side of it briefly i mean i don't mean to be crass but you know i was, I was reading about spotify um and, and these these people who are, who are being challenged to change their ways and, and make uh music more profitable for artists it's, it's quite tough isn't it if you're a new band to to actually to earn a living it's pretty tough isn't it i dread to think what goes on in in that those situations i mean obviously i know three or four very young bands because i tend to latch on to one like one a year for some reason and go right i'm just going to get obsessed with them and i don't know how the hell they make it work i really don't i mean things were bad enough when we were starting out in the MySpace era, just the streaming, just before streaming broke, we never really had a uh, a pre, we never really had a CD album, shall we say. You know, Man Alive was on iTunes and it just went from there. Um, but at least you paid for stuff on iTunes on that record. From then it just went free, you know, and, and you don't make money from from, uh, from music. You, like full stop, you don't make money from music. You do make money from playing live um but if you can't do that like you can't right now then yeah full stop there's no there's nothing else um so yeah it, it can get pretty tough mm. especially if you're starting out i do not know how people often ask me like what advice would you give and starting out and and i just don't know how to answer it like be extremely lucky have good music um you know get out there just meaningless stuff because there is nothing to say <laughs> i don't know i don't know what to say like the internet's full music is full we, we there's no space for us you know yeah. there's no space no one has the attention span people, people will play one song off your record and then they'll play another person you know it's it, everything is we've got so used to um the the uh the, the format of, of the vinyl record when yeah. it, whenever it was invented and the 45 minutes of, of music that you listen to and then you take it off your record player that's just gone it's it's not it's meaningless mm. well it i've got my old vinyl here and, and, and I, I yeah well you know it's because you're old school <laughs> <laughs> although it is kind of back in a little way but it, if you zoom out and look at the history from say 400 years in the future like oh they they figured out how to record stuff in like 1880 or whatever and then elvis happened we had youth culture and we had pop music and for this weird time say 1950 to 2010 humans listened to 50 minutes of music mm -hmm. and then they stopped <laughs> like what the, that's just a complete anomaly but to us it's like that no but that's right that's what it should be um it's the same with with film it's like how long is it is, is an attention span is it 90 minutes mm. is it two hours is it for some reason 45 minutes when it comes to music yeah. there's all these weird uh, stipulations that we've that we think are kind of correct um but they're just nonsense and some of them are getting stripped away now with streaming and with um the way people listen to the way people consume media is to is to just pick a little bit here and there, like a, a huge tapas or something. Yeah, That's it's the best. It's so interesting that because I, I've got a, I've got teenage daughters and they both love music, and I constantly say, you know, you need to you need to get into an album. You need to understand uh, that mm. it, it's a song within the context of all the other songs. And then, you know, I was, I was just chatting to my daughter the other day. She was talking about. Uh, the last Arctic Monkeys album, she didn't like it when she when when it came out. Now she loves it, and I said that's because these albums are there for an uh, indefinite period of time. You know, I love going back to some old albums and rediscovering new new rhythms or whatever, and just thinking, wow, this is just powerful. Um, yeah, but I think I think music's being lost in schools in many ways. You know, particularly you know, I, I go into primary schools, so you don't see an awful lot of music knocking about, which is which is which is a shame. Do you ever well, do you ever go right back, Jonathan? You know, you like teach. Yeah, in, in terms of you know, like things like you said, you're in the choir. You know, some schools don't have choirs anymore. Oh, yeah, well, I th yeah, I was in I was in a musical school, I'd say, and I had a, a really good uh, music teacher, Mr. Young, and he made the choir. He really, really pushed that choir to uh, 
do some crazy shit for a high school choir. <laughs> um, like weird time signatures and, and parts that we just couldn't sing, you know. He was really ambitious um, and he would write these, he, he wrote his own Odysseus and it was performed once, you know, just mental. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think I was lucky and we, we, I was just at the right time to get taught um, a new AS level called Music Tech, which prior to that didn't exist. I think we were the first year to do it. Um, which was a godsend that taught me so much about how to record stuff and and using computers to make music and yeah i i i kind of haven't been into any school since i left school um although my mum's mum's a teacher but um yeah i i i just don't know what the crack is now i feel yeah, yeah may, maybe it this i was part of a generation that had it had it good when it comes mm, to music I don't know. maybe maybe well, Jonathan, it's been it's been absolutely great chatting to you. I love I love chatting music. You got gigs coming up, haven't you? There, there in the new year. Yep. Yeah, you're looking forward to that. Yeah, I mean that's a tour from that should have happened in like March 2020. No, probably earlier than that. It was earlier than that, and now it's happening April 21, uh, 22, 22. Yeah. So yeah, I, it will be nice to play a proper tour. Yeah. And ticket sales doing well people can still get tickets yeah people are still uh still a little bit hesitant but i think as once we get through this winter it'll be go 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 hopefully or it'll yeah. be everything is closed and everyone's dead <laughs> yeah well let's just keep our fingers crossed and and i really appreciate talking to you like i say i love chatting music and uh you know, um, I'm going to keep keep listening to everything. Everything. It's a band that's new to hey. me, and I've and I've thoroughly enjoyed it. So uh, all the best from Burnley down the M66 down to Stockport M60, and uh, say, Jonathan, thanks for coming on the Godcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Cheers.